The Social Democratic Front retains its first vice president, Joshua Osi, as a full-fledged member of the party. On this edition of Newsroom, find out why the National Executive Committee turned down the article of exclusion against Osi. Also coming up this hour, the military in Mali sweep the juiciest positions as Prime Minister Shogel Maiga unveils his new cabinet. Stay with us for the latest on that story. And Ghana and Gabon make their third entry into the UN Security Council as non permanent members. We'll tell you more on the process that got them there. Those are the top stories. Dash Newsroom starts right now. A very warm welcome wherever you are watching us. I'm Ponje. Thanks for your company. We begin in Cameroon where the National Executive Committee of the Opposition Social Democratic Front has ruled that the first Vice President, Honorable Joshua Osi, will not be excluded or expelled from the party. This was the main fallout of a crucial meeting which was held in Yaoundé over the weekend. Peter Sosia reports. Joshua Osi has been maintained as the first Vice President of the Social Democratic Front, SDF. The party's National Executive Committee, which met in Yaoundé, did not confirm the two clause slammed on him by Littoral Chairman Jean-Michel Nincho. By implication, Osi remains a militant of the Littoral region. Vexed by Osi's signature in a letter to U.S. Congressman, Jean-Michel Nincho told pressmen in Douala that the first vice president of the party had excluded himself from the region. He later launched a complaint at the party's disciplinary committee last month. With next decision, only time shall determine the reaction of Jean-Michel Nincho. But he says that he will keep fighting for change, despite the odds. The two big weeks of the SDF, since long-serving chairman John Fundy made public his plans not to seek another mandate. Observers believe that the stool of the national chairman remains the goal of Nincho and Osi. Thank you, Peter. Now, Africa has two new representatives at the UN Security Council. Ghana and Gabon were voted as non-permanent members of the 15-member organ recently. As you'll hear in this report, it brings the total number of African non-permanent members to three. It's a major comeback for Ghana and Gabon, who are no strangers at the UN Security Council. Coincidentally, both countries have been elected into the organ for the third time. Ghana got 185 votes, while Gabon picked 183. They were among five non-permanent members of the Security Council elected on June 11th. They now jointly form the 10 non-permanent membership of the Council. Their role will be to look into issues of peace and security around the world, together with the rest of the 15-member executive team, five of whom are permanent members. Africa as a whole now has three representatives with Kenya which was already a member. The newly elected members will serve for two years. Different parts of Africa are riddled with conflict as things stand. With areas like Cameroon badly in the quest for peace, it remains to be seen whether its Central African neighbor, Gabon, will be able to put in a word at the UN Security Council for the country's dire situation to come in focus. In Chad, some citizens have taken to the streets in support of the ruling military transitional government. They say the only way out for the country at this point in time is to follow the guide of the military government in place. A cry, however, which clashes with the demands of many other Chadians. King Slinche has more. We want peace. We want no war. These were some of the phrases used by the individuals last June as they gathered around the court of justice in Jamina. Contrary to all expectations, these judges came out not to criticize the military transitional council, but rather to encourage the latter. Going by some of them, the military transitional council will be able to bring peace back to Chad through a successful transition. While the work was on, others kept forging for dialogue. This work in favor for peace comes at a time when the country is in dire need of an inclusive dialogue. Thank you, Kingsley. Now, he made a promise, and now he has delivered. Mali's Prime Minister, Shogel Maiga, now has a cabinet to pilot the country's transition. The 28-member government has seen key positions given to close aides of President Asimi Goita, who assisted him stage two coups in just nine months. Peter Sosier has that story. 
Military officers have grabbed key positions in Mali's new government. Colonel Sergio Kamara returns to the Defense Ministry after his removal by former head of government Mukta Wan ignited President Goita's second coup in just nine months. Another coup actor, Ismail Wagi, remains Minister of National Reconciliation. Former Chief of Staff of the Malian Army, Daoud Ali Mohamedin, takes charge of security. White Territorial Administration is now occupied by Lieutenant Colonel Abdullahi Maiga. Modibo Kone, who was security officer, has not been reinstated in the new government. It remains unclear how Mali's partners will react to the new government, but pundits say that it could ease tensions and sanctions slammed on the volatile country. Asimi Goita, who recently overthrew Bandao, assumed the presidency last week and named Shogel Kukala Maiga as his new prime minister. He has promised to ensure the organization of hitch free elections next year, in keeping with the transition demands. You're watching Newsroom on Dash News, and here on this network, the news never stops. Let's now go over to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the population has been anxiously waiting for the relic of independence icon Patrice Lumumba. Well, they'll have to wait a little longer because the planned tribute to Lumumba has been postponed to January next year. This, according to the country's president, is owing to a possible third wave of the coronavirus there. For that story, here's Bibiana Shinitanvuma. Patrice Lumumba, the historic icon who went through storms from the Belgians for his country, the Democratic Republic of Congo, will no longer be celebrated this month as was planned. This is because of the surge in COVID-19. Before the end of last week, the health ministry in the country declared that close to 250 new COVID cases had been recorded in barely a day. This has caused what their president described the brink to a new surge. As patients saturate their hospitals, President Felix Shisekedi warns that this new wave of contamination seems deadlier than the previous. Authorities have therefore taken more drastic measures to curb the surge, one of which is the postponement of the anticipated tribute to Patrice Numumba to January of next year. The Democratic Republic of Congo's Ministry of Health by June 10th had administered at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine to 29,262 people. A very worrisome situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo there. In Nigeria, citizens stormed the streets across the country over the weekend as they observed their Democracy Day. Protesters condemned bad governance, insecurity, and the recent Twitter ban by the government. More with Subiru Madina. <laughs> A peaceful protest with demonstrators chanting pro-democracy songs like Buhari Must Go. Nigerian activists on Saturday called for nationwide protest, a day which marked the Democracy Day as the country moved to civilian rule more than 20 years ago. Bad governance, insecurity as well as the recent Twitter ban by President Muhammadu Buhari are some of the issues many demonstrated against. Many Nigerian states, including Abuja, Lagos, Oyo, Ondo, Ibadan, Port Harcourt, and many others, took part in the protest. Coinciding with Democracy Day and marking the anniversary of Mashud Kashimawo Abiola's election as Nigerian president in 1993, Abiola's victory was annulled by the then military government, plunging Nigeria into months of civil unrest. Hundreds of protesters were fired with tear gas by Nigerian police. Buhari, a former general first elected as president in 2015, has been under pressure of our growing insecurity, as many protesters say he is Nigeria's biggest threat to democracy. Well, let's now talk some sports, shall we? Hosts Cameroon are moving into the quarterfinals of the Female Africa Handball Championship. They now top Group B after earning a hard-fought 26-21 win over the Democratic Republic of Congo at the Yaoundé Multipurpose Sports Complex. Once again, Subiru Madina walks us through this story. 
They picked their qualification ticket on Saturday after beating their Congolese counterparts 26 goals to 21. This was during a quite tough encounter. It comes after the handball lionesses appeared more determined as they outscored Nigeria to a 31 to 19 win. Three games, three wins, following their victory against the Democratic Republic of Congo, which makes them top of Group B. The indomitable lionesses have recorded a success which allows them to finish the first round with no hitches. The African Championship is scheduled to end on June 18 and will act as qualifying tournament for the 2021 World Women's Handball Championship to be played in Spain. All right, just before we go, let's update you on the development in Israel because Naftali Bennett has been confirmed as the new prime minister of that country. Despite severe tensions in parliament on Sunday, the 49-year-old right-wing nationalist takes over from long-serving leader Benjamin Netanyahu. Bennett will serve for two years before handing over power to Yair Lapid, whom he coalesced with to out Netanyahu, who spent 12 years in power. While promising to unite the nation, Naftali Bennett has begun receiving congratulatory messages, including from U.S. President Joe Biden, who expressed his desire to work with the new prime minister. Well, we will continue trailing that story for you and bring you the latest as we have them. And that does it for this edition of Dash Newsroom from me, Pondi, and the rest of the team. Thanks indeed for the copious privilege of your time. Stay with Dash News because, as you already know, we are Africa's news leader.